We have a young lady congenitally missing two mandibular incisors. Very difficult patient to treat for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, as a younger patient, an 18-year-old girl, anything in the aesthetic zone is going to be a very, let's call it high aesthetic value, young girl. Number two, two adjacent teeth. And the attempt to have an appearance of, of a nice papilla that is symmetrical with the rest of the mouth is difficult to obtain. So let's look at this comprehensively. You know, we don't manage everything just by, you know, an abutment or by a surgical technique and a connective tissue graft. And we go to our friends, the orthodontists, and say, hey, can you take these two lateral incisors and move them into the central incisor position? And this was done very nicely by a, a good friend of mine who, uh, who several years ago passed away. Excellent orthodontist, Dr. Joey Oppenheimer, uh, moved the two lateral incisors into the center area while creating uh, or maintaining enough space for implant placement to be placed. And so we're managing a, a difficult scenario of aesthetic development of papilla and symmetrical soft tissue by having adjacent implants by creating two individual implant sites. And then we go through the same format. We take our home beam CT scan, we take our intraoral surface scan, and we integrate the two data sets, do our implant planning, and we use our evidence-based parameters uh, in patients that are congenitally missing teeth. You have to always take into consideration that the vertical position of bone that exists is usually going to be level with the vertical peaks of the adjacent interceptal bone, which means if you're going to develop an aesthetic restoration, you generally have to place the implant subcrestally, usually by several millimeters. So by going ahead and having a virtual wax up and anticipating where you want the tooth to merge through the soft tissue based on your virtual wax up, you can make measurements from that point and know, okay, here's why I want to go ahead and position my implant. So that's done for both implant positions. And from there, the STL format uh, is or data is taken to create a surgical guide to allow us to do this. And so we use a guided surgical technique. So we know exactly where in three dimensions to go ahead and position the implant. A palt up advanced narrow platform implant is going to go ahead and be placed. So that's 3.25 millimeters in diameter by 13 millimeter length. And so the implant is placed subcrestally uh, at, at the exact dimensions because of the guided surgical technique and the precise planning using evidence based measurements. And then I recontour the bone, leaving the peaks of bone on either side to support the pillar, but to go ahead and create the appropriate position for bone to support the anticipated free digital margin position that we would like to go ahead and develop. We then take uh, and, and insert a tie-based provisional restoration with the proper shapes and contours to support the soft tissue, harvest connective tissue from the palate. Some, when we do a sub, sub appeal connective tissue graft, place in the pocket or underneath the periosteum on the buckle to fill out the concavities and, uh, and complete our, our procedure in a very routine manner. We come back and we look, this is now six months after the implants were placed. You see we have a large volume of soft tissue. That's great. This is what I want to see, right? And I even look at my level of my papillas, and although they're not ideal, they you know, will fall into the symmetry of the adjacent soft tissue profile. And now using a laser, I can recontour out the, the position, develop a position for its free gingival margin. And therefore, we can, you know, fairly predictably finish the position, the patient in this, in this, uh, in this manner. And so again, we can utilize our criteria for value in this. We can do this efficiently, we can do this effectively, and we can do this very, very predictably following a simple format, okay, that if anyone follows that same format, they should be able to obtain the same result. And again, we use this by using evidence-based parameters. So let's talk about, uh, about uh, uh, guided surgery. And I'd like to introduce you to a new concept in, in guided surgery. I had somewhat of a background in guided surgery where I had uh, a company called Implant Logic System uh, that I sold to BioHorizons in 2008, where we had software, planning software, as well as uh, fully guided surgical guides that were made. And they were all based on concepts that I had uh, patented back in the late 1990s. So I took that long experience in guided surgery and said, what can we do to make it a better or more predictable experience? Because it's still not perfect or ideal and still doesn't apply everywhere. So I, I came along up with the engineers at Paltop, uh, a concept of contra-angle based guidance. 
and it allowed several important factors. Number one, one of the problems in guided surgery is, is when the drill goes through the sleeve, it blocks all the irrigation. Right? And we know that uh, one of the critical factors in having implant success is not overheating the bone in terms of the time of implant placement. And so we created a design that allows irrigation on the drill through the whole drilling process by having a window on the component that guides the drill. So that through the entire drilling process, we can see that irrigation is going on the drill as it spins uh, during the anatomy. So important concept number one. Number two, we know that the drills are very long when we go and use guided processes, which limits you know, where we can go ahead and utilize it. So again, using this contra-angle-based guidance, we can have angled entry into the sleeve allows us to place implants in all areas of the mouth, even in first molar and second molar areas, areas in most cases. And then thirdly, right, the, when, the, when the drill spins around the guiding cylinder, frequently we see metal shavings being cut, right, because the, the drill or the cutting blades are spinning against what's guiding it. So again here, because of the design, this fully guided design of what we call our uh, contra-angle-based guidance, there are no spinning blades that contact metal at any time. And therefore, we have no metal shavings ever from our drilling process into the surgical wound. Again, third very important concept. And we do this through contra-angle-based guidance. There's a device we call it the DGS, Digital Guidance Sleeve, integrates with the head of the contra-angle. So there's a specially designed contra-angle that's part of the kit uh, for fully guided surgeries. So you see that there are these two rods as part of the DGS and it integrates with the head of the handpiece. And the drills fit in and out of this DGS and contra angle. And the guidance comes from the DGS sleeve itself. And so we go through our series of drills with ever expanding sequentially you know, sized drills by changing the drills in and out of this DGS or digital guided sleeve. So the drills are long. So how is it that we have guidance from the sleeve when the sleeve is just on a short segment of the, uh, along the length of the drill? So through the protocol and process, first a short pilot drill is used and it's designed so that the digital guidance sleeve contacts or enters sleeve in the surgical guide for the tip of the drill of this bone. And it creates, in this manner, a initial pilot osteotomy. It enters into the bone two to three millimeters and creates a purchase point to start the drilling process. And then you go through the series of sequence of drills as you're guided to by the protocol with three different length drills, 20 millimeters long, 25 and 30 millimeters long. And it's for all the sizes of implants, 3.25, 3.75, 4.2, and five millimeters. The system is very versatile. It has countersinks, although they should almost never be used with the top system. And so very effectively, and you can utilize guided surgery in almost every patient. You have a drilling report that comes through the particular surgery or the particular software you're going to going to use, whether it's a three shape implant studio or exoplan or uh, blue sky software. And the critical numbers are number one, the drill length. So the drill length here is doesn't go according to the implant length. It goes according to the distance from the top of the sleeve to the base of the osteotomy. And in this manner, uh, it's very versatile in terms of of how you go ahead and utilize this guide. And again, we have three different lengths, 20, 25, and 30. And then we also, the second important number is the key offset, which is the offset number that tells us how far to deliver the implant. So again, 10 millimeters here doesn't indicate a 10 millimeter length implant. It means you insert the implant to the 10 millimeter line on the implant key, position the implant so that its head is where it was designed to go ahead and be, and be placed. And again, by not tying the, the drill length and the implant key length to the implant length, uh, it makes the system very versatile in terms of usage. And so here's how it looks. Number one, the pilot drill is utilized to create that initial two to three millimeter purchase. Then we go and change out the drills. Here it's purple, so it's a 25 millimeter length drills. The drills are all color coded, both for length and diameter, right? And now it enters into that initial point. The, by design, the opening of the osteotomy is always 
wider than the beginning of that drill. And so the drills just simply gets swapped in and out and you drill until you bottom out the, until you bottom out the DGS or digital guidance sleeve. So we're not looking for any lines or, or anything like that in terms, of, in terms of measurements. If countersink is going to be done, that's also done in a guided fashion, although with the Paltop system, again, countersinking should almost never be done and be done cautiously because the coronal segment of the implant provides a lot of the implant stability. And then you can have guided implant stability you know, as well. And you can use the system as is appropriate. Some people just want to go ahead and do drilling. Some want to do just initial drilling. Some want to go through entire, you know, implant placement. So all the tool, tools are used, are there for your use. And as you gain more experience with the system, you can go ahead and, and utilize the system in varying different, different ways. Now, Osteo densification is a, a very big topic in the world of implant dentistry to expand bone, to go ahead and do closed, you know, sinus, uh, sinus, augment, sinus, sinus augmentation. And by design, because of the design of the Versa or Densa drills, they can be utilized with the Paltop fully guided system. The drill length just has to be set for 25 millimeters because of the length of the Versa drills, but they can be utilized for that. So just a... a Quick patient. This is a patient of also a uh, excellent restorative uh, doctor, Dr. Gila Jedwab. This patient had a bicycle accident uh, a number of years before. Yeah, we lost the tooth, uh, and they did some initial treatment when the patient was younger and placed these zirconia crowns along with some endotic therapy. Now is the time to go ahead and change the treatment. And so again, we do take the two data sets as part of the protocol: cone beam CT, intraoral surface scan, merge the two create a plan for implant placement. And we look at it, this is what we find. We find that there's, there's inadequate bone dimension. So this is a narrow dimension implant, 3.25 millimeters in diameter, but there's inadequate bone to go ahead and do that. We add to the complexity of that, a very large incisive canal in that area. And add into that, that we have a, a root of the additional lateral incisor converging on the space. And because of the trauma to the area, you can see there's already been resorption of the root. So nobody's really interested in orthodontically moving this tooth unless they're planning on extracting the tooth later on. So can we manage this? So we're going to do this through, as opposed to doing some uh, initial regenerative therapy or bone block grafting, we're going to go and expand the ridge through the process of osteodensification. And so we'll use the protocols and sequence from uh, from Versa, and here's our surgical guide that's been 3D printed from those previous data sets, as well as the provisional restoration design, which will sit on the adjacent uh, uh, central incisor with a wing designed into it to sit and rest on and be bonded to the, the adjacent lateral incisor tooth. With uh, with digital treatment today, it's very easy to make two. Well, why do I want two? Because if I'm trying to match the shade and I'm not sure which one will fit better, it's very easy for the laboratory to just put in a different PMMA puck, okay, a different acrylic puck of a different shade, and they can make the same design exactly, very simply, uh, by, um, by just repeating the process without charging me all over again. So I encourage you to develop a relationship with your laboratory that through the process of digital techniques, you can go ahead and you can use the advantage of digital techniques to produce two types of restorations without you paying for two types of restorations. And uh, in this way, you gain the advantage of uh, digital technology without the laboratory having to do a lot of extra work. So we go through the whole process, as I previously stated, um, of, uh, of the drilling sequence following the Versa protocol. Here, after, even though it's guided surgery, because it's a very precise position, I'm going to create my initial osteotomy and then place in a parallel pin. Is a parallel pin uh, from Paltop that has all the gradations of the different lengths in it, so I can verify that I'm not going to run into the root of the adjacent tooth or the incisive, very large incisive canal in that area. And then I will proceed with drilling the final depth as well as expansion of that ridge. And so I go through the entire protocol sequence that's appropriate for the 3.25 millimeter implant. Um, in this osteotomy, I'm actually not even going to undersize it because then I'm going to fracture the bone or the buccal plate. It's going to be very thin. But you here can see when I put in my implant body try-in, uh, and I always like to do this in all of my cases, whether they're guided or not, so I can see exactly where I expect the implant to seat. Now, this is especially important in guided cases because in guided cases, frequently the implant will be placed subcrestally. So how far subcrestally do I expect it to see? 
But here you can see I've had a successful expansion of that ridge and I've not violated the adjacent uh, uh, parallel ligament space or the incisive canal at this, at this point. My, my implant this is going to be again a palpable implant with the SLA surface treatment and seated to its guided position you know, through my uh, surgical guide. Here's our, our implant position. I can a, a nice expansion of the ridge as compared to what I anticipated from my planning. I put on uh, my pin to get an ISQ measurement. I measure all my implants, even though it's not going to be an immediate provisionalization because I want a value to compare it to at the time of recovery and restoration. Even though I am doing and following the protocols of Densa in this very thin bone, I still want to go ahead and develop a, uh, uh, as much bone as I can. So I'll do a regenerative technique with an allograft and resorbable membrane tacked into, act, uh, tacked into place with the provisional seat in place. And here you can see my implant position, right? Again, uh, you know, we're close, but uh, in good position relative to the adjacent lateral incisor and the uh, incisor now. And here you can see it's the healing with the final, with the restoration designed in place by Dr. Jedwap, where we have a, uh, not ideal, but a fairly, you know, good and acceptable result, you know, for this patient. Again, did I meet my value criteria? Well, I collected the data in one appointment, and the next appointment was we were ready for surgery with the implant being placed in, in the ideal position for this particular patient selecting the ideal technique. So it was efficient, it was effective, and it was predictable. We've now developed kits for the, Gen for the Genesis implant line, a fully guided kit. Uh, we'll load all the parameters, as well as a fully guided kit for the Prima Plus implants. Both these kits use the DGS contra angle based guidance with its advantages, as I have just described. The difference is that there we made an attempt to simplify the procedure. And so we limited the versatility, but simplified the procedure by going ahead and tying the implant length to the drill length. So if you're going to go ahead and put in a 10 millimeter implant, this is the implant line that you would go ahead and utilize. You know, if it's a, you'd use this first drill and then the 3.5 millimeter drill, if it was a 3.5 connection or 3.8 or 4.5, and you would just pick the drill by the length of the implant. So this is not the length of the osteotomy, but the implant length. We then simplified the implant key, and we did the same thing, that you pick the implant key to deliver the implant by either or both the diameter of the sleeve that's in the guide, as well as the dimension of the connection. So if it's gonna be a 3.5 or 3.8 connection, abutment connection, then you would pick one of these three, either the 4.1, 5, or 5.8 sleeve, or if it was a 4.5 connection, right, you would go ahead and pick the 5.1 or 5.8, or the 5.5 implant, you would be down here. And then you can just pick a short or long, both will deliver the implant to the exact same spot, it's just a longer key for, you know, ease of, of use. So you took all the advantages of the, of the fully guided system developed initially for Paltop, meaning we have direct irrigation on the drill through the window in the DGS, we have the ability to go and place the implant or utilize the kit in almost every application, no matter how far posteriorly, uh, because we can much more effectively manage interarch depth, as well as no cutting blades against metal, so no titanium uh, 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 residue inside the surgical wound. So here's what it looks like. Initial you know, pilot drill goes and creates the initial osteotomy. It's actually a short pilot drill before this. And then we go through the series of shape drills, whatever the implant line is. This is going to be for the 11 and a half millimeter implant. You see, we're showing you some videos of some testing, as well as then implant delivery um, that allows the implant to be delivered to the exact position, not only in vertical orientation, but connection orientation um, as well. And then the, the ratchet tools and all the tooling necessary to go ahead and appropriately deliver the, the implant. Now, this is again for both the Genesis as well as Prima Plus line, two different kits uh, ink for using it. It's for all lengths of implants as well as all connections of both systems. And this will be released very shortly when all the clinical testing is completed. Now, in order to do the things that uh, I showed you, you need to have a digital compliant implant system. 
um, which means that you need to have surgical libraries that, uh, that uh, are appropriate with the appropriate geometries for your implant. Um, that means the connection or reserve connection also needs to be part of it. You need full restorative design laboratories because as part of the implant planning today, we also take into consideration either the provisional stage for immediate provisionalization as well as the restorative stage and the final, rest, final restoration. So implant positioning in three dimensions, we can take into account final restorative design. So we need to have restorative design libraries in part. We need to have the appropriate components for the digital age, which today means that you need to have uh, appropriate design high bases. You need to have appropriate design, you know, multi-units, uh, as well as all the components that integrate with them, whether they're primary components or scan abutments and all of those items that are, in, that are embedded in uh, software libraries from the major design softwares. And then you need to have surgical systems that integrate with those designs, because when designing the surgical guide and designing the systems, you have to be able to design a laboratory needs to be able to select the appropriate geometry of implants, the appropriate design of the restorative restorations, as well as the appropriate design and dimension of sleeves that will fit into the geometries of the design of the surgical guide. So just one case that kind of demonstrates, you know, all of these things. So here's a patient who's going to go and uh, lose this this bridge that they have in the in this area over here due to extensive decay, and the plan is going to be to extract those teeth and place three implants and immediately provisionalize this case. So again, the same two data sets we go and utilize, which is the uh, the comb beam CT as well as intraoral surface scan. They're integrated together. The laboratory can though then go ahead and create their designs of, of implant uh, uh, position. I verify that those are the positions that I like. They've gone and now designed a provisional restoration along with the multi-units that are going to be used and the titanium cylinders that are going to be used. And the design is incorporated within that a spacer around these provisional components because regardless of whose system it is, nobody is placing the implant so exact and so precise that they're, they're, that you can, you can design a component to fit into the restoration pre-surgically that will require no modification. And so in order not to have to fight with the provisional restoration by taking out your drill and, and opening the hole more and cutting it there, and then you get frustrated and the restoration breaks and all those things we all suffered with, I want to be able to take my provisional restoration and just slide it into place. I don't care if I get a little acrylic or a lot of acrylic, I just don't want to fight with that provisional. And that's what this design will go ahead and do. And these are part of the design features of the software as well as design features of the libraries developed by Paltop and Keystone. So here's our provisional restoration. You can see I edited it. There was an implant posteriorly from previously, and I thought perhaps I would go ahead and utilize it, which is why we have that molar tooth added onto it. So here are the two elements. So on appointment number one, we took our comb beam CT scan and digital scan. The laboratory designed the implant placement per my prescription. I verified it, and then they created a surgical guide for that. Uh, you can see there are different colored sleeves. There's purple, there's silver, and that's because it's color coded to the fully guided system. So what does that mean when we the system tells you which drill to use, which drill length? As we previously stated there's 20, 25, and 30. They each have their own color. So a a purple color means that I'm supposed to use a 25 millimeter length drill here. And a silver color would mean that I'm supposed to use the 30 millimeter length drill there. So it's color coded to make it simple. And then I have my provisional restoration, again, from the same data set. So we extract the teeth. I, I debride the sockets, seat the surgical guide, go through the sequence of drilling. There you see my osteotomies. Here you can see, because this is a previous Pontic site, that uh, there was uh, you know, a fair amount of resorption of bone in that area. I put my implant body try-ins into place to verify what the position of my implant seating is going to be. And then I do my implant delivery. This is the Paltop Dynamic Implant. It has a more aggressive thread design, but the same geometry, so it's the same drilling protocol. I just will generally undersize uh, the final drill. So I won't go to the final drill and allow there to be a little more compression and cutting a bone by this more aggressive through design. What I like to do, especially in a, an immediate provisional type of stage. Here you see my implant placement according to plan. 
and I've harvested cortical shavings of bone from the drill. The design of the of these drills harvests a lot of bone. I've mixed it with a xenograft, right? And I've gone and I've now grafted out the intrabony defects as well as where I want to fill out the defect on the buckle of this middle implant where there's been a lot of bone resorption. I've now take the multi-units that have been pre-selected by design in the planning software, seat them into position, take a radiograph to verify their seating, make sure they're not being held up, because I don't want to reline this, and then take a post-operative radiograph to find that my component wasn't seated completely. It's a sure way to have implant failure. Then I place the titanium cylinders, temporary titanium cylinders on top of the, of, the, of the implants, and I just slide the provisional restoration into place. So you see I didn't have to make any modification or go of the, of the provisional restoration. It just goes to place because everything was pre-designed for that. I then take these little aprons. Uh, this is a product that also has. And so I take this little apron. It's a basically kind of pre-cut rubber dam. I slide it over the component so that I don't have any acrylic or if you're going to use closet that will run down over the abutment and lock this into place, you know, following curing. So I seat these little rubber dam uh, aprons over this area and I reline the provisional restoration. Uh, when I remove it following setting, you can see that I have some deficiency in this area, and that's because that's where the rubber dam is seated to. But then I can go and just take some acrylic, and I very quickly paint that into position. Very quickly, I complete the relining procedure of this, of this restoration in a, a very nice, clean manner. Now, while that was curing, when I painted that in, I came back and I took these healing abutments. These are healing abutments not for implants, but for multi-unit abutments. So I placed the multi-unit abutment on, and then I placed this healing abutment on top of it. I utilized the torque value settings, because if I just tighten it tightly by hand, what's going to happen? Well, I torque down that multi-unit to the indicated 30 newton centimeter, and then I put the healing abutment on, and I tighten it by hand. Chances are I'm going to be applying more than 30 newton, newton centimeters of force, which means that when I go to unscrew the healing abutment, the multi-unit's going to going to come out. So I put these on gently, and I follow the you know recommendations, which will be five uh, five newtons, and then I can suture around these healing abutments. I take some collagen plug. Right, and I've generally cut into these little pellets and I tucked it under the surgical wound over the graft areas, not for regenerative purposes, but just for obstructive purposes so that I don't have any uh, graft material leaking out. And I can suture around this knowing that I can now remove those healing abutments and just seat my restoration and the soft tissue is not going to interfere with it with its seating. So we have components that manage all of these aspects. And this is how the patient comes and walks out the, out the door actions, implant preparation, implant placement, component selection and insertion, and relining of the provisional restoration, all that's done very effectively and efficiently because it's all been pre-planned to exactly uh, by, by specification. Now, uh, these type of systems integrate with all systems. So uh, here's a patient that was coming for an all in four type of technique. Uh, she had previously failed implant treatment prior to coming to coming to me, and so she was managed using a chrome technique, right, where they use a printed metal frame for to secure the surgical guide in place, as well as for bone management or bone reduction with prosthetic platforms and platforms to verify that there's been adequate bone reduction, and it allows the seating of the provisional restoration in a predetermined position. So it's a very programmed matter. And they can, and this is a product from Chrome, or other companies can also, uh, there are two or three other companies that have similar types of digitally programmed events. And it's done to make a very, um, a very streamlined process in a, what can be a very, time-consuming, consuming, tedious, uh, long day for the patient and the surgeon and the restorative doctor. And this streamlines it where these procedures generally can be done completely, completely in three to four hours. And so here's what the patient like this here, we place six implants. Um, I prefer placing more than fewer for these types of cases. But again, this is what the patient looks like on the day that the procedure is done and how they walk out the door. So I said to myself, well, you know, 
a one one four is great. That type of technique, you know, extracting teeth, put in four implants, five implants, six implants, and immediately provisionalizing it. But there are some factors that are part of it: the large amount of bone reduction, um, aesthetically at the level of the gingiva, it's not ideal for all patients. And so, you know, I haven't, at least in my practice, abandoned the sequential extraction patient. So here's a patient who, you know, came and uh, was proposed several different modalities, including, you know, uh, all an X type of treatment, as opposed to doing a, a sequential extraction strategy. She opted for the sequential extraction strategy. And so I said, okay, but is there a way that I can employ that all on X programmed technique, that digital technique that I just showed you, which simplifies the surgical and restorative end on the day of the procedure, can I do that for a sequential extraction case? So here was going the plan going to go ahead and be. All the maxillary teeth were going to be extracted. They were non-viable for a definitive restoration, as you'll go ahead and see. You can even see in the comb beam CT, this is, you know, it looks like she has more bone on the panoramic views than in fact there actually exists. So all these teeth are going to be extracted. The plan is going to place these four implants in the uh, available bone, then graft at, or at the same time, both sinuses and utilize these three remaining teeth transitionally to support a provisional restoration so she could stay in fixed implant treatment. So that can be a long day, right, to go ahead and, you know, extract teeth, make a full arch provisional, graft sinuses, and put it in place, you know, implants. You know, can we use program techniques to go ahead and make this more efficient? So that's where we start to go ahead and start thinking, putting our thinking cap, because we live in the digital age. We shouldn't be doing things today the same way we did them effectively, but 20 years ago. Are there ways that we can go ahead and, and improve uh, both our experience uh, as well as the patient's experience? So here's the plan. Here's the plan. The first day, the patient has, uh, you know, their consultation, and we create a plan, and we take our comb beam CT, and we take our initial scan. The patient comes in the second, second time for a visit with her sort of doctor. And the reserve doctor is going to go and prepare these three teeth, one, two, three, because those are the three teeth that we're going to use for the provisional restoration. So this was done by an excellent restorative doctor by the name of Dr. Lenny Brenner. He prepared those three teeth uh, that I asked him to, and I said, okay, and just put a, a provisional restoration. So very quickly, you know, the patient comes in for an hour visit, and three teeth are simply prepared, and a provisional restoration that replicates exactly what they have now is inserted inside their mouth, a very routine treatment for, you know, uh, restorative doctors. From that, at the, when that's done, an impression is also taken. So here, a digital impression is taken at the same time. It's all super gingival margins, so very easily done. We now take that digital impression and we integrate it with the cone beam CT. So here what you're seeing now is a picture of the implant positions from the comb beam CT integrated with the data set or the intra oral surface scan of the one, two, three pair of teeth. Now, utilizing the features in this design software, the teeth that are going to be extracted, the ones not being utilized to support the provisional restoration, are virtually extracted. The provisional restoration design is made. The patient liked the way that she, that her original teeth looked like. And so the laboratory just can go and replicate that design. So there we see it's a copy of what she had in her mouth before. that is now going to sit on the prepared teeth. So here we have our three prepared teeth, right? And have the digital impression. You can see their virtual extractions. It was integrated with the data set from the comb beam CT. And here's the design of the provisional restoration, right? And you can see one, two, three teeth that it's going to sit on. However, take a look. We have these cantilevers because we're giving her a provisional restoration that's going to, uh, that's going to uh, cantilever. And so if we just make this out of PMMA, what's going to happen? You know, it's going to break. And that restorative doctor, well, whoever's making the restoration isn't going to be happy because they're going to be seeing that patient in their office every other day managing this. But we could do this again conventionally, We're doing a cast metal reinforced provisional restoration using conventional techniques. But hey, we're in the digital age. 
You know, can we do this in a digital fashion, not to do it just with technology, but so that it's easy and streamlined? And so can we utilize materials that we use in the digital age to go ahead and do this? So here's the, the, the concept. Well, let's not make it out of PMMA. Let's make it out of zirconia. Right, let's make it out of zirconia. It's easy for the laboratories to go ahead and do this, even as a provisional restoration. Now, this has to fit precisely. It has to fit precisely, and I'm concerned about that. So I asked the laboratory, you know, make one out of zirconia, take the same exact design, but now take the zirconia puck out, put in the PMA puck, and remill it. So I have a backup because if that zirconia doesn't fit, Right. I don't you know, how am I going to get this to fit? I'm going to start preparing teeth and adjusting and all that. You know, the whole point in this is make it streamlined. So if it's PMMA, if it's acrylic, it can be an easy adjustment to make it fit. I'm giving myself a backup. It's a new protocol that, I, that I'm working on. Here's my plan. The patient comes in. Here she is. OK, she's ready for her procedure. Number one, using a piezotome. I open up uh, I open up both sinuses. Reflect the membranes, place my grafts. I choose in these types of procedures to, to, to do it side by side and not give anesthesia to the entire patient's mouth because I can manage my anesthesia more effectively by going in and doing it instead of the patient complaining that they're starting to have pain because of the procedure. Now, we have grafted both sinuses. Now I'm going to remove the provisional restorations on the prepared teeth. So the three teeth that had provisionals, I've removed the provisional. Right, these are the three teeth that we're going to go ahead and uh, and support the provisional restoration. Uh, it's going to come on. All right, great. Now we just have to clean the cement. Now we extract the teeth. You can see now why these teeth need to be removed. Right, so we extract teeth that are coming out, and we're left with just our three teeth that are going to support the provisional restoration. So here's what the patient looks like. Actions are done. We divide the sockets, cleaned off the cement off those teeth, those three teeth. And it looks just like our design. Remember, what we're seeing here is our design of uh, the scan of the prepared teeth that were done in that one visit by their sort of doctor. The laboratory then integrated the data set, placed the implants, right, with the comb beam CT, and virtually extracted the teeth. And you see, we can. it's easy for the laboratory to, to replicate exactly what's going to happen. And from this, we create, the laboratory creates our design of our restoration. So now let's go and we're going to place our restoration inside the patient's mouth, right? So here's our restoration. Remember, I've got two. I've got my zirconia and I've got my, I've got my uh, PMMA. So I bring the patient, I have the patient there. I take my restoration. I hold my breath. My fingers are crossed, right? You know, is this going to work effectively? Full arch restoration going into position, right? And boom, right into position. Okay, right into position in terms of that. Wow, how much time did I spend in the restorative aspect of this case on this day? Uh, a minute or two? A minute or two? Wow, look how effective I can be. So there's my provisional restoration just initially seated to place. Now we're ready to place our implants. So here's the surgical guide. The surgical guide has been created from the laboratory from the same exact data sets to seat on the prepared teeth. So let's go ahead and check it. We take our surgical guide, the EC purple sleeves, so 25 millimeter length drills. All right, we check our windows to make sure that the guide is seated completely. And we can begin our drilling protocol. So we take our, our drill here. We don't start with a short pilot because we're engaging that sleeve right in the socket or that drill in the socket. So I take my initial uh, pilot drill and I drill in the correct position from site to site to site. Then I go through, I swap out the drill to whatever the appropriate size drill. This case is gonna have 3.75 millimeter implants. But I'm gonna undersize them like I told you I like to because I'm gonna use a more aggressive dynamic implant, which means I go from my 224 initial pilot step drill to my 3.25 millimeter drill. I drill that sequence and then I'm ready to go and place implants. So I've removed my guide. I put my implant body try-ins as I previously uh, described so that I can verify my implant positions and where exactly I want to seat them to. And then I go and I deliver my implants. So I select the correct key according to the plan. 
that's the Paltop Dynamic Implant. So same geometry, just a little more aggressive thread. And I seed it to position according to the plan and the, the, the correct depth as indicated by the drilling report. And then I do my intro bony bone graft, place my collagen plug, suture each area, place some cement here. I use some Duralon as a provisional cement and I seed it the provisional restoration to place. So in a very effective manner, I can graft both sinuses, extract the appropriate teeth, uh, place the, the four implants, and then restorative time on the day of surgery is all of, you know, two or three minutes, okay? Not this two or three hours or having to coordinate between the restorative doctor and the surgeon if they're not the same, if they're not the same, uh, the same person in terms of doing it. So here is our plan. Here's our post-operative CT. So in the panoramic view, we're replicating the implant position. Here's our plan from an axial view, right? And notice you can go ahead and look at these uh, criteria uh, relative to known landmarks like the entire canal and the implant position, you know, as well as as well as the um, as well as the uh, adjacent teeth. And we can look at it from a cross-sectional perspective also. Um, how that appears, and we can see that we can very predictably replicate that positions from going ahead and uh, what's planned to what actually occurs in those areas. So it's one appointment to collect the data. What's my data? CT scan, comb beam, and intral surface scan. Second appointment, we prepare one hour. So we prepare three teeth and just put simple provisionals. And then third appointment, the patient comes in and we do the entire procedure with no restored time. Okay, we just grab the sinuses, extract the teeth and place the, place the implants. So did we create value, our criteria? It was efficient, it was effective, and it was predictable. Now, let's look at other ways we can go ahead and use digital, digital data. So here's a young uh, lady around 65 years old, maybe even a little older, that came to see my partner, Dr. Alone Woltuck, and she had previous implant treatment. Now, it was not done by us, and I can't say that I would have necessarily position the implants or restored the patient this way, but this was done probably more than 15 years ago, so I can't fault what was done, but when she comes in in distress at nine o'clock on that morning and sees uh, my partner alone, and he's got a schedule full of patients, and she's got a bridge that's, you know, fractured implants that are fractured, and she's in distress, and she needs some type of treatment because these teeth can't stay in her mouth, even for the day, he's got to some way help her. So at nine o'clock in the morning, he goes and he removes her bridge. And he identifies that there are three implants that he can that he can go ahead and utilize, even though, you know, here you can see the head of the fracture to one of the implants, even though he can't necessarily maybe use them or all of them in a final restoration. But he says, okay, I can use these provisionally. And so he goes and puts some scan abutments on them and takes a digital scan. So that's his collected data. There's no comb beam CT here. We're just talking about restorations. So he collects the data. So in a half an hour, he you know squeezes in some patients at nine o'clock in the morning, and he removes the bridge and takes a digital scan. And now I'll introduce a concept that I'll call virtual technician. And many of you may be already you doing similar things along similar lines. So number one. He collects data in the office and he sends it to the laboratory. You know, how does he do, do it? Does he put it into a bag and call for a pickup? No, it's digital data. He collected the data in that half hour and he pressed the button and it went off to the laboratory. The laboratory now takes that data and they create a provisional restoration design. How long does it take them for a full arch like this? Well, you know, they can spend even two hours going ahead. It's not so, so quick and simple for them to go ahead and do this. But, uh, you know, laboratories that are experienced can do this fairly effectively. So now this technician has gone and he, he, he got the data at 930, spent two hours. By 1130, the restoration is designed. And he creates from this these design files, these STL manufacturing files. And what does he do? He sends them to the office. Does he call for a pickup and put it into a bag? No, these are computer files. He presses a button and it gets to the dental office. So at 11.30, it's back at the office. Nine o'clock, the patient came in in distress. By 9.30, the scan was taken and sent to the laboratory. By 11.30, the design was done and sent back to the dental office. In our office, we have an Amon Gerbach Servo Motion 2, a five axis CNC machine. The 
assistant takes the right color puck, puts into the machine, presses the button, and for a restoration of this size, takes approximately two and a half hours to go ahead and mill. So now we got this by 11.30 in the morning, you know, so then it's 12.30, 1.30, by two o'clock in the afternoon, we have this milled restoration and we can schedule the patient. So one, scan in the dental office, okay, it happened by 9.30. Two, the design was done by the laboratory, done by 11.30. Sent back to the office that was manufactured through a simple process, just uh, putting a puck in and, and, uh, and pressing a button um, that my you know, assistant can go ahead and do. So by two o'clock in the afternoon, it was done. And this way, at the end of our day, we schedule the patient to insert it inside the office. So the patient came in with an emergency in the morning, a complex emergency, and maybe we don't have an ideal result, but we're able to give them what I would call full arch resolution in a very effective, predictable, you know, manner. So was there value at that point? Yeah. And how did I use it? Well, I used a combined effort right, where I used the laboratory for designing surfaces, and we're able to go ahead and do simple manufacturing, okay, uh, in our office uh, for... Um, to be able to resolve this patients quickly. So it was effective, it was efficient, and obviously predictable. So what happened with our patient, Carol? Remember our 96-year-old patient? So here she is, she wants permanent teeth. She told me she doesn't care if it lasts two weeks, right? Remember when you're 96, time is uh, takes on a different role in terms of doing it. But again, she's 96 and she's healthy, but, but you know, how long is she gonna sit in that chair and how extensive can you make that treatment and what can she tolerate? So we create a plan. It's going to be to place four implants. We're not going to do an immediate load for her, okay? We place four implants. She can wear her partial denture while this is healing, right? And place the implant. So here's our plan, right? Point number one, we collect the data. It's a dual scan technique, meaning, uh, uh, you know, a, a CT scan, you know, with and without her, her denture. Um, and appointment number two, we do a minimally invasive, very efficient, very limited flap reflection, right, implant placement. We finish the procedure, and Carol, as she's walking out the door, she says, okay, when are, we, when are we doing the maxillary surgery? You know, for her time, you know, a month, two months, three months, that's a lot of time for a 96-year-old. So I said, you know, Carol, let's see how you're feeling in two weeks. Two weeks, she feels great. The next week, we schedule her procedure. Right, and we do the same thing. We create our plan, make our surgical guide so we can do a, a very minimally invasive, fast procedure and place implants that don't require any grafting in the bone that we could go ahead and find for her so that we can relatively quickly get back to a doing a final restoration for her. So appointment number one, we collected the data, the cone beam CT, the dual scan technique. And the second appointment, we did her mandibular surgery. And the third appointment, we did a maxillary surgery. It was the same data. We can go ahead and do both things. And that's how we can treat a 96-year-old doing two full arches of, of treatment. Now, we can use all other types of things. We can do guided implant uncovering. So here's a patient where there was some extraction, some implants, and there was grafting that required bearing of the implants. And so we go to uncover the implants. Again, if we want to create streamline the treatment, I can put the surgical guide right back into place. And because the patient has a very wide zone of keratinized tissue, and I wasn't looked to correct any soft tissue deformities, we take the soft tissue trephine and we put it right through the guide to go ahead and directly identify the implants um, and implants that were buried in bone, right? We didn't have to make any significant. Let me just go back and show you that again. You can go and see here, the implants are completely covered in bone. And yet having done that, we don't have to go ahead and make any extensive flap to go ahead and do that. So we can uncover the implants, place multi-units and place a scan above this to take a final restoration without having to be concerned that we're gonna have any significant soft tissue changes because of trauma inflicted on the, on the soft tissue. So we can streamline treatment there also. We can also come up with all kinds of innovative provisional restoration designs today, as opposed to doing provisional Maryland bridges where we used to use cast metal frameworks, we do this all in, in uh, PMMA. And here's one that's going to be, uh, you know, uh, used for two implants. One was placed and one was being covered at the same time. And so, again, it's easy if I need to, you know, destroy the bridge to to uh, take it out after it's bonded in place and replace it with a new one because of the sequence of procedures with PMA. The laboratory just presses another button. Again, this is a relationship you need to develop with your laboratory, you know, along that basis. And here's a different design where, where uh, oh, an implant was initially placed the soft tissue was left to heal. And then this second, because they were adjacent implants and we want to try and maintain 
the soft tissue profile, right? The, the uh, several months or four months after the first implant was placed, the second implant is placed. And so here you can see the provisional restoration design that's going to engage the first implant, right? Create ovate pontix to maintain the soft tissue with, you know, appropriately designed gingival embrasures and Maryland wings so that all the force is in place on the implant itself. And here you can see this is as it's inserted. And here you can see it uh, several weeks later that we're maintaining those papilla and soft tissue profile. Custom healing abutments you've probably all heard about. We can use custom healing abutments to manage not only to maintain the, the emergence profile, but to correct deficiencies. Here you can see that we have uh, a full uh, disc cavity that resulted uh, after an extraction. And we can go ahead and by designing a custom healing abutment, it's like a custom abutment designed to put the, the emergent position of the restoration out of the soft tissue in the, in the correct position, uh, it's like a custom abutment that I've cut off the coronal aspect of it. So we design the provisional restoration or we design the design of the restoration we'd like to have with emergent profile from the soft tissue we'd like to have, not dependent on the soft tissue position today. And from that, we go and we design a custom healing abutment that will manage the soft tissue and put the soft tissue out into the position we'd like to have. So without any soft tissue grafting, without any hard tissue grafting, right, using a, a prosthetic component or a healing abutment designed for the application, we can create a proper emergent profile. One last patient I'd like to share with you showing, let's call it the, the power or capabilities of digital technology that exists today. And here's a young girl, she's 18 years old, comes to my office, she's congenitally missing 26 teeth. You see, all of these teeth are primary teeth and they can't be used for any type of final restoration. The only teeth we have left in her mouth for any type of restoration are two first molar maxillary molars, or two maxillary first molars, two central incisors, and two second molar teeth. There's nothing else there. You know, this is really what we're left with. And so she was uh, initially managed by the chairman of the Department of Orthodontics at the University of Pennsylvania, where he elegantly aligned the two central incisor positions, which was critical for us, and expanded the maxillary arch to where he thought it should, should, uh, should be. Um, and this is was our starting point in terms of being able to uh, treat and manage this patient. And so here is the patient through her course of her treatment. So first we have to decide where her teeth are going to be. So we create, and this is her inclusion by the way, in occlusion. We create a provisional design to see if I like the circumference of the arch. Extract the teeth, place the provisional restorations, and make an assessment. And once that's confirmed, we can now proceed with our surgery. So, a guided surgical approach is used using triangle based guidance, management of the bone, management of soft tissue, is our implant placement being healed, assessment of the mandible, very narrow anterior mandible, monocortical bone block grafting with additional augmentation, healed bone, designed for implant placement, fully guided surgical techniques, multi-unit based restorations, digital design of layered zirconia restorations. So screw retained by design, except for the history and digital restorations, which have zirconia copings placed on the second molar teeth because of inadequate vertebrae for first molar restorations. So overlay restorations with zirconia copings. So this is what we can do today. So it's not just uh, replacing some impression material or taking a cone beam CT to see if there's adequate bone, but it's a complete integration of the process. So if we go back to our additional questions and think about value and we ask the questions, what do we do with it? And is it useful? And is it productive? And is it cost effective? And can we produce dentistry that we want to place inside a patient's mouth? So let's see what Carol has to say. 
is the right time to start thinking about and learning more about technology and how it can affect what you do on a daily basis in a valuable manner? I'm all excited so far. I have the post in it and I'm waiting to get the teeth and I will have a mouth of a 20 year old and I'm all excited. So Carol actually has her final restorations. I should really incorporate her final x-rays and, and restorations. And so we're able to go ahead and, uh, and uh, fulfill her, uh, her uh, requests. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I'll be available now to answer questions, or if not, you're welcome to email me at my email. Uh, that's m.klein at paltopdental.com, and I will try to respond to your questions. Thank you for your time today.